But now you've come into the Anagarika life, homelessness through taking taking the eight precepts formally in the middle of the Sangha as an act of, of making a formal commitment which we call Pakao, becoming a Pakao, which actually in worldly terms simply means that you've got white dress right now, which in a way like you're doing what you've been doing before, you were dressed in white, you're already shaven as a lay visitor of the monastery. But to take the precepts formally and make this this vow to to train in the training precepts in front of the Sangha is another level of significance both for yourself and for the community. It's like becoming more formally engaged and having the the volition explicitly out there in front of the community and um, we're welcoming you to take part in, in the community actions and the ways of living together on that level much more than somebody who just passes by and abides by the standards here in some way but has never really mentioned explicitly I do want to take this up as a training Sikapadang as a training path this is like the key factor of the whole monk's training as well is that idea of a training path where you gradually kind of perfect yourself through abandoning the things that are unsuitable for the monastic form and uh, abandon the, the household attitudes, getting more involved in the samana, sanya, and the perception of oneself as a renunciant, a peaceful, a peaceful practitioner who's gone another step away from the world. And um, the idea of having it as a training path means that in no way you can be perfect straight away. It's a training. Sikha means the training, the education um, program, so to say. And what we affirm now is the sila sikha, the training in the, in the virtuous conduct that is appropriate for somebody who lives a monastic life. And it is quite difficult maybe to always keep those precepts in in a perfect way but important is to have the intention to train yourself so that's very much the same with the monks rules later is that we are in no way free from defilements in no no way free from corruptions or inner poison drives or cravings and desires and it so happens every now and again that we do miss especially the finer points of the precepts and the guidelines that the Buddha laid out there for us to keep. So in that sense, we practice to reset ourselves and immediately admit this wasn't quite right. And um, we start again with, with a sense of telling the community or another monk or another member of the community that I've done this and that, in the future I'll be restrained. So it's the good intention of keeping these things that's the crucial factor of embarking on the training. It doesn't mean that one is perfect. In, in, in fact, it's a good way of constantly reminding oneself that one is aspiring to something much higher than just simply the conventional kind of act of speaking something in front of a group, but it's a, a training of the heart that gradually has to grow through one's own actions and through one's own also um, wrong actions. Like, um, so you gradually notice when, when you've overstepped some boundaries, so having clearly stated those boundaries first. In the world, things are usually quite undefined. Anything goes. You get the freedom of doing whatever you like. And, uh, and um, now this is like a self or group imposed kind of framework which makes us realize very soon when we've kind of overstepped certain forms. Of, of course, the idea generally in the Buddhist training is to arrive at a point where the forms 
don't have any relevance for your state of mind where you can be peaceful with anything that happens. But the way to get there is through keeping in line with the things that don't create conflict for a sense of no no remorse and a sense of delight in, in, in yourself and, and stilling of the worries that, that happen when you create trouble through other beings. And this, these are not only the community members, it's also any being like, um, say, the first precept, for example, Banatipata, we're not killing any being, not even mosquitoes or whatever, you know, like um, any small, small living beings that we can see and that is good enough to catch our attention, we refrain from taking its life. So it's, it's a very broad ethical concept which any any Buddhist to a certain extent needs to take on anyway, but it becomes more explicit in the framework of living in a monastery and in the framework of not having personal, kind of a personal life in that sense as householders have. Like the term that we use for the Pakao in Pali is the Anagarika and this is a term that means like um, somebody who does not have a house anymore, who doesn't live in a household framework, but he lives in the monastic framework, in the framework of this training rules. Yet there are Anagarikas living out there in the world, famous Anagarikas throughout the history of Buddhism. One of them is Anagarika Dhammapala, for example, who lived in India and revived the holy sites and the practice around them in and uh, about a hundred years ago, or whatever, you know, th there's many ways of practicing keeping those precepts for us in what Banana Shad, it means entering the community that practices likewise to that level of keeping the eight precepts as a training guideline for oneself to perfect oneself in order to uh, yeah, fulfill the threefold training of Sila, Samadhi, and Panya for the sake of liberation. And it, it's a step away from worldly things, very much like which you'll see in the in the training precepts that you've just um, spoken in Pali. If we go through the meaning of the training precepts in English language and understand what the scope of it is, it is much more than just simply things that you live by in ordinary life. Which the five training precepts for for any Buddhist are there out there for, as a means for liberation on the level of those people that are bound up with family, with house and work and things like that. Whereas we can take these things a little further, the five precepts become eight precepts because there are certain ascetic practices which go away from worldly lifestyle involved, and explicitly the sixth, seventh and eighth precept. And, um, and the third precept becomes more hard and fast, kind of um, centered around uh, the monastic etiquette in uh, in a way that um, uh, you know we have lot, uh, not many social relations that we need to keep. Just the third precept is about sexual relations. So we're in a group where sexual relations don't really matter in, uh, because we don't have wife and kids, and um, more or less there's not much to think about in that sense so it can be more radical and going away, a step away from what average family men do. So, and the um, sixth, seventh and eighth training precept are a bit like, like the Dutanga practices a little bit, like in that sense, like a voluntary practices for those that are our training in a monastic form, um, a semi-monastic form, if people still say on, on the Oposata day, like the lay people from Bungwai take these eight precepts for a day. So it's compatible somehow with, with, with like um, taking a step still in the world, having still one step in the world, one step in, in the monastic form. So it's a perfect way to test out like can I renounce some of the things that are common for people out there, but not not um, in the in the model of training for somebody who walks the, the monastic path? So I go through the precepts in in the in the way that the 
we we undertake them like one one by one, just um, as a sense of understanding that that we are how we see them in the monastery because there's so many ways of looking at them and the Buddhist Buddha's teachings in many ways they're open to a lot of interpretations and you'll see that particularly in the forest tradition there's a certain interpretation of the vinya the the discipline or the the training aspects of the of the monks which which we abide by in a in a common understanding so this is also a chance now becoming an anagarika with the eight precepts and the and the monastic etiquette um, as a as a commitment to understand more what this con- conventional side of living together in the sangha means and you're welcome to always ask questions about the monastic etiquette and about the monks training rules so you can understand a little more more how the framework gets more more detailed as as you walk, move towards the yellow robes so <clears throat> this is one thing that we do want the pakaos to participate in the formal life of, of our sangha and the um, the informal life with like the contacts to the the, the monks and the, the dhamma discussions also is anyway is something that we nourish our inspiration by and you're welcome welcome to be closer to the sangha in that sense anyway but um, in terms of like understanding what the formal commitment in this partic- particular way of seeing seeing monastic way in the forest tradition is like uh, something uh, you can gradually explore and um, the eight training precepts they do reflect parts of these like so they're not really specified very well in ex- in detail in the in the scriptures, just as um, as the um, Samanera precepts them they coincide with the um, Anagarika precepts, except for that the Samaneras take on another additional precept of renouncing to deal with gold and silver or money in these days. Whereas you yourself, you still keep your financial lifeline because this is a, a kind of like uh, a temporary commitment so to say for for testing the waters and for living the form in a way that you can understand what's happening so to make the next commitment if you if you feel ready to so <clears throat> we don't give up money and we don't give up our, our personal support system in that sense so we're halfway in the sangha halfway so have one foot outside, but in our in our attitudes towards the training, we take it on fully to just move away from the world, um, bit by bit, in order to see what it is like, whether we can can live this lifestyle, whether we understand the meaning of it, and we see the benefits of of um, <clears throat> stepping away one one way from from the things that we are used to, like uh, or the things that in for example, like the Buddha spoke about, as like the, the not leading directly to the end of the suffering of, of suffering, they're leading to samsara, the, the worldly um, attitudes, and the passage that you've just recited, the sambhato karava sora chopato. For example, you can find in the context of the Buddha talking about the noble search, the arya pariyasana, which takes you <coughs> away from things as like wives, slaves, and cattle, and and crops and things like that, but it takes you to to those things that are um, you know bound for um, for the non-aging, non-sick, non-sick, non non dying, and uh, the undefiled. And, uh, and this is the search that we undertake in the in the practice. So the first training precept is about like not to take life of any form and and you already know that we do try to respect that very very thoroughly and like we have the um, idea of like not killing even the, the slightest little creature if we're consciously aware of of it sometimes may happen that you sweep the path and ants get tread on or die or so but like this is something we try to avoid but it life in on this planet, life in samsara, in some way, does need m- mean that there is there is also the ending of life. And but important is very much to keep your intention away from 
from any killing process, like in a, in a, in living living this lifestyle, living this this life, this training path to um, have a inclination towards non-violence in your in your actions and be physically unintrusive and and non-threatening, like in in the way you conduct yourself. This is very much. Uh, a principle of the samana is somebody who is peaceful and inviting people to trust and um, and you'll see that even animals can feel that attitude and it's actually quite crucial to live the forest monk's life um, to have that attitude otherwise you'd be getting into trouble there's a lot of um, lot of beings around in in this in this world that that do sense the intentions or non-verbal com- communication of, of a being entering their realm and entering their space. For example, we're living in the forest. We're actually guests here, just just as any other other creature. We're, we're, we don't have any entitlement. The kuti that we live in equally belongs to the the spiders and scorpions and snakes. They, they don't have any sense of that. This is reserved for us. So to have that whole attitude of peaceful coexistence without harming any other being is very, very crucial for our, our life, being, being able to be sustained in the forest. And you'll see that sp- spreading metta, loving kindness, using the protective chance to dispel um, the unwholesome attitudes in our minds towards other creatures, that, that's a very crucial part of the training and that's the first precept in detail so that we don't slap mosquitoes and things like that like don't even give way to that feeling of like we get some extra comfort from from you know like being negligent towards the life of other beings so we rather take the discomfort rather suffer with a wholesome intention and a peaceful mind than having it comfortable and nice or free from possible threads so that's something you'll get to experience more and more and um, the second second precept is about not taking what is not given, and um, to train oneself and not not expecting to or not be entitled to things, and in the worst case, not not transgressing ownership, not, not to take anything that you, you're not quite clear of who it belongs to, or even volitionally know that it belongs to somebody else. And this also. Um, kind of um, involves communal possessions, say things like um, things that are lying around or so, like in the monastery, or things that are there for communal use. We develop that sense of caution, not just to simply feel it's all right to take them, but like if they haven't been really given to us or designated for us, or there's no permission to use them, we just don't do things, we just refrain from that. We, We can build up the the attitude of, actually, I don't need anything. I've got what I need. The things that one is entitled to as a monastic are, are, are things like um, living on the foot of a tree, living from bintapata, from alms food, and um, li- living from rag robes, and living from you know fermented urine as a medicine. This is something that we'll gradually get to know more, how to get by with little. And so there's no sense of um, um, being entitled to possessions, in, even though we don't take a, a vow of possessionlessness as monks. That there's a lot of training rules around um, things that we are allowed to have and that we are not allowed to have. And many of the things, um, of course, they have to do with the lifestyle as well, and, but generally they refer to an attitude of contentment, being somebody who's like, Easy, easy to live wherever he goes because he doesn't need much, and uh, he'll experience that through having that little, um, that new pakao robe as well. As, uh, this, these are your possessions and your and the bowl and the, the the sitting cloth and things like that. These are minimal requirements, and whereas the kutis and these things, we just we're just guests in there, like, and it's an attitude of. Of non non possessing things and not infringing on the rights of of other people um, to taking what you know just in doubt about things we in the world usually we think it's okay we get by with it and we can just cut the corner somehow or do it when when nobody sees it and um, or just assume 
that it's all right. And generally, our attitude now in the monastery is not not to assume anything. We just assume it's not all right. It's assume we don't need it. And um, so that that's one mindset we move away from worldly sense of entitlement to to goods through the respect that these goods may belong to other other people and creating a, an attitude of trustworthiness and non-conflict and in terms of our relation to the material worlds. And, and so the third precept is refraining from any sexual activity, which is the one that takes you into the realm of a, a monastic, uh, somebody who practices the brahmacharya. The brahmacharya is a high ideal of being celibate and um, having having nothing no bonds on a personal, sensual relation with any any being, and even with yourself to refrain from from sensual indulgence in in the broader sense, but also in the sexual context. We don't have any sexual activity even with ourselves. So I think that's one of the prides of the monastic orders of Buddhism that we're very strict on things like masturbation and things like that. We don't just ever get close to that and it's something I don't think is explicit in, in other monastic orders and other religions. So at, at times these things are difficult and at times it is kind of um, a challenge. Again, like um, just search the um, you know, advice of other, of other monastics and, and search the ful- fulfillment in, in things that are non-sensual like um, meditation or like um, sometimes you know it can be service like where you sacrifice something on the physical level like you go do some wood logging or so in order to di- direct the energies that come up naturally in a in a physical body towards something that is neutral or possibly something that you know, kind of deviates it, the energies of course we also have a lot of skillful means in meditation to build up a a sense of independent from sensuality, which is a practice that you don't come across very much in household life because they live with family, with, with wife and partners, and, uh, and they have all kinds of ways of gratifying their desires which are not considered unworthy or like... Um, but for us, like the ideal is just to be more or less like using all the energy that come, usually goes into sexuality for something that's more uplifting and that takes you away from bondage, takes you away from that feeling of um, being a slave of the desires to, to go go back to to your own inner kind of refuge, the, the contentment that, that arises from just being by yourself and being able to use all the, the life force that you have in a, in a way of transcending dukkha rather than getting into dangerous areas where you get jealousy, you get, you know, like a never-ending process of addiction, possibly. So this is why the brahmacharya is considered such a high value, because it really takes you away from from cravings. And uh, which is, as you remember, like one of the main teachings that the Buddha discovered in the in the light, light of his enlightenment, that Dukkha arises because of tanha craving, and one of the cravings is uh, gamma tanha, tan, um, craving for sensuality. So we're willing to take that one step further than people out in the world that really do do have to re- rely on on that sense of partnership as a refuge. Whereas we take a higher refuge, which is the teachings of the Buddha, the, the example of the Buddha, and the example of the noble Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, is so our kind of sen- sense of where we rely on, if anything, and, and nothing in, in, a, in a worldly sense or in a physical sense. So um, sexual desires for, or like sexual relations are not only kind of explicit, like um, frivolous worldly sexual um, talk or things like that, or looking at things that are stimulating these things, which is fairly difficult in the monastery anyway. We don't have newspapers, we don't have media um, to, to provide that kind of access, which many people in the world do have constantly. But like um, to be restrained very much in, in the relation, like um, also to the lay women and to the villagers, the, the women that come on a daily basis, it's very, very good practice for an anagarika just to s- simply 
look away when some somebody attractive coming along don't engage don't don't necessarily kind of hang around there just kind of keep things functional practical and protect yourself from from those automatic nature ingrained processes of cravings that it may trigger for the sense of peace and sense of like independence from that and so um, physically we don't touch women and that's something that anagarikas take on as well and we don't speak to them when when we're not necessary and um, so we step away one 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 way out of society out of household or worldly life so then we've got the precept of of um, refining your speech like not to speak any false speech or any any coarse speech or any any speech that is gossip or even idle chatter um, as I mentioned the other day Tira Chana Kata an animal, animal talk as it is called in the scriptures talks about whatever kings, robbers, um, thieves, politicians so to say all these things like they're, they're not part of our, our monastic training in that sense that the Buddha saw these things are are endless and uh, so we we cut off um, an engagement even in, with our opinions and, and and our chatting around these things so um, idle chatter sampapalapa and it's part of the sub specifications that are actually given for the eight precepts um, in uh, in regards to speech so we refrain from that or of course, harsh speech, gossip, devi- gossip, divisive speech, for the sense of unity and trustworthiness in the sangha, in, a, in our in our mutual relationships. That's very important to be somebody who is really reliable and um, truth. Um, uh, somebody who's bound up with truth in his speech. Very, very beautiful ideal, but difficult to keep. Sometimes the worldly habits of exaggeration or like making yourself into more than you are or whatnot, boasting a bit and or like um, twisting the truth a bit because you feel embarrassed and and if that these things come up you notice them and reset yourself and find a quiet time to tell somebody actually you know I didn't mean that and uh, I'm, I'm sorry in the future I won't say things like that again it comes up quite a lot in the monastic training that you, one notices especially speech patterns are are very subconsciously ingrained and once you've said something you can't take it back it sometimes leads to a whole chain reaction which is definitely a karmic um, event a landslide sometimes it can happen very easily so to be very careful around speech and not to say anything that's wrong or even harsh or even hurtful is something very very worthy of taking on it creates a sense of trust and integrity with oneself and in relation to the others. So speech, musawata, false speech, um, to refrain from that. False in that sense that it also um, means speech that is <coughs> that is violent or speech that is divisive or speech that is void of sense. So I cut that out for coming back to the essentials and to a sense of peace and truth, truth um, living in, in a sense of truthfulness. And then, then we've got like Sura Maria Macha Pamanatana, anything that's intoxicating and, and addictive, that we refrain from that. And uh, for the monastery, this also means smoking. So um, all the anagarikas are absolutely pro- prohibited from smoking. Also, when you go outside right now, you're, you're representing the anagarika training. It, it, it stays with you because you're you're embarked on this and, and so if you have to do business in town or so um, all these precepts whether it's the one about um, not not using um, intoxicants or whether it's the one about like not eating in the afternoon or things like that it's very important you're, you're also quite supported by this whole um, monastic um, commitment in that sense that lay people uh, are um, sponsoring our, our lifestyle here very very generously and they, they know the standards so and they they know that it's a life project of 24 hours a day you can't just switch on and off and find a corner where you're able kind of to to still 
still do things that other, in other areas don't fit. So there has the sense of con, consist, consistency. So um, especially with smoking, I'm very, very strict. If I see anybody with a cigarette, he's out more or less. Like that's that's it. Uh, it then it's a good test for oneself to be able to get away from from addictions, test one's inner strength. That's the way we do things here. Like. Um, so this, then the other intoxications, like then generally not available, but of course need, need to be mentioned. No, there's no alcohol and nothing, nothing that's and anything that has to do with drugs, which in in some of the monasteries starts getting getting a problem with with young village lads being possibly drug addicts or so coming into the form. I trust that everybody here is, has stepped away from that, even though one may have had addictions in the past, um, this is the time to absolutely keep things clear and make a fresh start. And, and um, So <clears throat> the reason why we take up this training not to have addictive um, substances support us in our well-being, so to say, you know, people argue like LSD in the 70s was considered to be mind-enhancing and things like that. We just want to be independent and do this from strength of our own mind and uh, be able to access our resources as they are there, there in natural uh, in nature and not have that overkill of whatever um, influences from outside and to be dependent on those and it, it is very much the strength of mind the clarity of mind um, that that is inherent with each and every life that that we want to be able to access, and uh, it's a very uplifting feeling to to be able to do that, to to step beyond the ordinary consciousness through the power of mind. Is all we we're trying to to do when we're meditating. So it's counter counteractive to uh, towards meditation if we take intoxicating substances. That's one of it. But you'll see in the monastic life, there's a. <clears throat> There's other addictions that can up, come up in, a, in that sense that people get addicted to coffee, caffeine, and things like that, or, or sugar, and all kinds of things. Of course, they're not in that precept that would be impractical to kind of like draw the line that rigid, but it, like in the, in the sense of being independent in oneself, it's very good to keep one's mind clear from all these things that are possibly kind of creating cravings that are that are kind of beyond the, the normal normal daily um, daily engagement so say something that becomes into a habit of addiction having to have a cup of coffee or having to have a cup of tea or so or emroy hasip our monastery is emroy, emroy hasip free and he said this kind of um, whatever power high caffeine power drugs that that truck drivers need for, for, for the long journeys and we just don't have them here. So the five precepts are now complete but they're a bit more refined, a bit more more kind of going to the center of, of, um, of a spiritual life um, that does away with worldly things. So and the six to eighth precept are explicit more about like some kind of ascetic lifestyle where you test the waters of of living with less comfort than than household life and less distraction and one of them is not eating in the afternoon like afternoon formally is 12 o'clock or like as a convention in in our in our group of monastery um we define it like that and 12 o'clock um and um, for the monastery itself, it's very easy to keep it because we just have a one meal a day practice as a dutanga practice for the monks, which is a voluntary thing in the training of, of monks. But there's a permission for the, that the Buddha gave to have certain monasteries just take on certain ascetic practices. And those who want to join them are welcome. Those who don't want to are welcome to go somewhere else. So we've got it extra to the point we just eat once a day at eight o'clock and every now and again say on Katina Day, New Year's Day, sometimes you may you see that there's an official exception to that but like apart from that we don't eat anything even though you as an Anagarika have access to a lot of things in the kitchen 
and possibly temptations come around food quite a bit to the level of people even stealing food and, and snatching it away, which is preaching on the first precept in a much more direct way. But like um, to be able to help yourself every now and again with a spoonful of that, uh, this and that, something that um, the, the cows are specifically in, in danger areas because you have to do, deal with the kitchen. For the monks, we're far away from that. We don't even enter the kitchen or touch the fridge or so. So it's very clear also that Bindabad food is usually after the arms round. Everybody renounces his, his share of food. It becomes communal. And then we receive it again at 8 o'clock. So no biscuits, no three-in-ones, nothing at, at the side for, for us. Like we just keep it very clear for the sake of our, you know, uh, our own training and seeing the boundaries. So, um, and um, this one also, when when you go to town and you got some business, it's very important that like the the faithful lay people that know what Banachat all over, all, all over Ubon, all, all over Isan, or even in Bangkok, they don't see you with an ice cream at three o'clock or so. That it's very important. That may destroy their faith quite a lot. Or like um, like a, a milk coffee. That's we we consider milk to be part of food. So there's more more to say about it. It's a big discussion in the Vinaya what counts as food and what not. But we take the standards of the monks for the Anagarika in defining what is food and not, and the 12 o'clock cut-off time. <coughs> um, whereas on the regular routine, it's even more exaggerated that we only eat. At, at the communal times in the sala, not in the kuti, nowhere else, just together, unless there's kind of sickness or like circumstances that kind of require it, then we can always talk talk about it. If say <coughs> hospital stays and things like that may be different. So that's the <coughs> sixth precept. The seventh precept is all, all about this kind of worldly things that spin around fantasies, make one attached to sensuality in a less coarse way than sexuality, but sensuality in terms of entertainment, sounds, smells, tastes, um, odors, tangibles, and um, the whole thing about communication, like um, with uh, or like communication devices, we're very strict in that sense that we don't want people to be able to watch videos and 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 even whatever. Right. other things on the internet or so, so we don't have all these devices. That it does count um, somehow in, into that precept that we abandon all the entertainment, <coughs> music, singing, dancing, shows and, and movies and things like that for the sake of living out in nature, to have a natural um, sense of relating to the things that are there already in in, with our life and to directly experience them not through any extra kind of um, embellished and, um, and trivialized way which does make us not experience dukkha that we want it to, to become apparent for us to be able to transcend it and to be able to, to go against um, our tendencies to love sukha, love pleasure and not be able to put up with uh, with dukkha, with with discomfort and frustration, or like sensory deprivation and things like that is something they they fear a lot in the world. Whereas we actually love it. We close our eyes, find it conducive to meditation if there's less input. So that seventh precept is very crucial for facilitating meditation. If we constantly are bound up with the things that are <coughs> that are. Um, stimulating um, the desires through eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and, and mind, then then we won't be able to shut down and 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 um, get the more refined um, gratification of of like um, living in living on on the breath on on nothing actually. And in terms of requisites, like. We're forest monks. We live live in a natural setting. We're not living in a city where you got like lots of cars and 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 advertisement and things like that. So it's quite easy to see the benefits of simply <coughs> listening to the sounds of nature, knowing 
knowing how you know the temperature feels we don't have air condition or we don't have fans and we don't have light uh, electric light in the kutis we keep it basic we're living a kind of recluse's life like a hermit um, even though what banana chart is is in a in a kind of park like setting it's like more like a, a reservoir for hermits it's, we're not really out in the in the wild here but you'll you'll be able to experience that as well we've got branch monasteries where where we just live with a mosquito net in the jungle without any contact to other 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 monks or or or, or anagarikas so that it it is important not to be dependent on these things so um, that's why we take this seventh precept very strict. So, so no, <clears throat> no singing, dancing, no whistling, no perfumes. Like say, no deodorant. We just use the alum stone. We do do use um, soap. Um, not so strict with that, but like in terms of any other things like um, whatever, like little rings, earrings, or whatnot. And um, we take off. I would say these days, like. To make yourself a new tattoo while your pakao is breaking the precept, it, that, that's my understanding of it. Like whatever one has already is is kind of up to the day and age these days. Like people come bintut, like adi, kind of with all kind of, bintuing is a word to um, like we use for the ropes. We make little marks on the rope to show that it's ours. And people in the world, they've got the attitude that they can mark their body and showing it's my my body. I, it looks like this and that. We don't do that as a as a monastic anymore. Like, but whatever one has and brings along, we're fine with that. But like, just to put it on on your consciousness. <clears throat> how how easily one has a sense of like manipulating, kind of customizing one's one's life, one's requisites with things that are kind of embellishing them, and and we try to live without that. Like that's why we've got this very simple, simple dress. White is very neutral, a sign of <clears throat> of the old old brahmacharyas in in India. Yogis take white white robes and. And possibly later yellow robes and as a symbol of renunciation so we don't have like bright colors around in the monastery something that possibly one isn't aware of but it, it conduces to a sense of like being being kind of grounded in a, <clears throat> in simplicity and that's that's all related to that seventh precept the eighth precept is kind of in line with that it, it's explicitly about <clears throat> Sleeping on the floor, not sleeping on beds, and <clears throat> not having big furniture, and it's also an advantage if you look at this um, how it, how it makes you able just to crash out anywhere. You can find a corner somewhere on the concrete floor and with whatever nothing on, underneath, you know, to you know, like which we do at the katinas many times, sleeping like the dogs somewhere in the corner, which is pretty pretty cool to be able to do that rather than having to have a room which is decorated and lots of mattresses with, which then need to be maintained and uh, washed and, and put away so we're just kind of able to, to sleep anywhere or like generally the idea between uh, of the eighth precept is not uh, not to make it too comfortable to find sleep because sleep usually triggers sensual desires as well dreams and things like that and and um, and uh, this is famous uh, quote. I think it's King Pasenadi after uh, that the Buddha gives the Dhamma part of words actually too, and says like after having eaten and indulged in the sensual sensual desires, they they sleep and snore like pigs. So we try to <laughs> be more dignified and be somebody who's devoted to wakefulness, Chakaryana Yoga, and that that <clears throat> that framework of sleeping not comfortable. Not seeking comfort in sleep helps that a lot to be always ready to get up and rather sit than sleep. And um, something where we try to put the framework such that it's not an area where where we get addicted to comfort again, and explicitly with sitting and sleeping. But if you've got physical <coughs> hardships with the aging body, there's also things what we can do, like with pillows and, and, and mats every now and again. Just then, then ask ask what to do. Say if your bones are aching, if you're sick and uh, you got a physical disability, 
and things like that, then then we can talk about it. But like not as a regular thing that we just kind of take that for granted that we <clears throat> we can sleep in in high luxurious beds. That's the precept. And going on a journey, say many times you find yourself say you go on a pilgrimage to India, <clears throat> you find yourself in cheap luxury hotels with 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 beds. Usually the monks they just sleep on the on the rack which is super filthy in, in India on the floor besides the big luxury beds. So it's, I find that's pretty impressive and pretty cool actually to be able to do that. And uh, so that's open for you as a training as well right now. So I've gone through all of all of the precepts. If there are any more questions in, in the way we take them or like definitely you'll get feedback if you if you do something that is at odds with, with, with the understanding of the Sangha, we'll, we'll let you know, but take this kind of little, <clears throat> little kind of criticism or pointing out like mistakes as, as information, because you're new to this, you don't know all these things, and your main motivation is to perfect yourself in these things, and of course we're never perfect, and the monks as well, they always need to live with their own mistakes and with the things that the, the, the friends in the holy life, they point out towards you and it's considered growth in the, in the holy life to see, see one's own mista- one's mistakes and to be able to, to correct them and be restrained in the future. And it's also a skill to learn while you're in the community to live with the shortcomings of others and with yourself and then be able to constructively increase the wholesome and abandon the unwholesome. The Sangha is very happy to, to have you in, in the midst on a more formal basis. Like I think it's a worthwhile step to, to test the waters, to, <clears throat> to find how much, how much the commitment actually involves and whether it's like liable to bring about growth in our, in our heart or whether it's, it feels inappropriate for us, you're always f- free, you know, to, to abandon the, the, the training precepts, but while you take them, you, you have to live up to them. That's a kind of the point about commitment, and they, they count continually. There's no holiday. Once, you, once you've taken them on, as a, as a prakar, we consider them, they're, they're there. Um, it's not like when when you leave the monastery you can go back to five precepts or so. It's just part of the the special um, special status as a pakha that you're formerly a member of the community. And in that sense, we'd like to welcome welcome you and wish you all the best. May all these kind of conventional conventional realities be a stepping stone to liberation, where we don't need the conventions anymore. And may you grow grow in the in the <coughs> The threefold training, so having taken the Anagarika precepts formally from the Sangha, we'd all like to give you a blessing now for chanting a welcome chant to the Sangha. And then that's about um, it for, for the instruction today.